I trust I have not laboured wholly in vain, and I trust in time. In spite of all opposition and obstacles, God will make bare his holy arm in the conversion and salvation of the souls of men. These are the words Richard Johnson wrote in 1801, in his journal the day he left New South Wales to return back home to England. His labours proved not to have been in vain, and a history of Australia bears testimony to this man that will always be remembered as Australia's first chaplain. Born in the year 1755 in Wilton, England, Richard Johnson was a son of John and Mary Johnson. He was educated well at Hull Grammar School, the same school William Wilberforce attended some years earlier. There, Richard was influenced by the mathematician and supporter of the abolition of slavery, Isaac Milner who encouraged him to follow the evangelical faith. Just before Johnson graduated from Magdalene College in Cambridge with the Bachelor of Arts, he was ordained as a deacon and with his BA, he served as an assistant clergy to the well-known parish priest, Henry Foster. Knowing that Captain James Cook had landed in the elusive Terra Australis in 1770, and the colony was to be started there, England's Prime Minister William Pitt wrote to Wilberforce on the 23rd of September, 1786. The colony of Botany Bay will be much indebted to you for your assistance in providing a chaplain. Seriously speaking, if you can find such a clergyman as you mention, we shall be very glad of it. But it must be soon. William Wilberforce was part of the Eclectic Society, and with other leaders like Henry Thornton and John Newton, the Society was a powerful force in English religious life and could influence official policy. Therefore, five months before the first fleet of convicts landed in Botany Bay, the Eclectic Society nominated Johnson, to whom John Newton bestowed the title Patriarch of the Southern Hemisphere. During this time, as English colonization spread to the corners of the known world, missionary societies were created to make sure the gospel followed, and a society for the propagation of Christian knowledge greatly aided Johnson's future chaplaincy by providing him with Bibles, prayer books, catechisms, and religious booklets against common sins, 4,200 books in all for the new colony. On the 13th of May, 1787, 11 ships laden with officers, convicts, women and children set sail and Johnson accompanied them as their chaplain. The fleet was led by Captain Arthur Phillip, who also became New South Wales' first governor. But Philip, a stranger to the evangelical faith, gave Johnson his specific orders. He was to enforce due observance of religion and good order among the inhabitants, and to take such steps for the due celebration of public worship as circumstances would permit. He was to cause the laws against blasphemy, profaneness, adultery, fornication, polygamy, incest, profamation of the Lord's Day, swearing and drunkenness to be rigorously executed. He was to take care that the Book of Common Prayer, as by law established, be read each Sunday and Holy Day, and that the Blessed Sacraments be administered among the rites of the Church of England. Philip considered this to be Johnson's main, if not only, duty. Yet Johnson felt troubled by this order to be a mere moral policeman, but conducted himself throughout the voyage as requested. Upon landing in Botany Bay on the 29th of January 1788, Johnson struggled to maintain an optimistic attitude. Over the last eight months of the rough voyage from England, the seas had taken their toll on the whole fleet. Johnson's wife, Mary Barton, whom he had just married before leaving, almost died of a serious illness, which led to their first child being stillborn. Added to this, Johnson found that much of his requested moralistic preaching had fallen on deaf ears. 
at 10 a.m. on the 3rd of February, 1788, on a hot midsummer's day, a dutiful rather than vibrant Johnson delivered Australia's first sermon. The text, Psalm 116, verses 1 to 2. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? The voyage had cost the fleet 32 lives, and the service was received well by both troops and convicts. It was hard not to be thankful for the arrival to land. In the following years, the task of chaplaincy to this new colony of convicts and troops turned out to be a struggle. Johnson was expected to officiate at all hangings, acting as magistrate when needed. In the first five years, Johnson makes record of 220 marriages, 226 baptisms, and 851 funerals. Though his tasks were many, Johnson laboured faithfully. While Johnson and his wife lived in a cabbage palm hut for their first three years, the governors enjoyed the luxuries of two grand mansions. Even when Johnson had to wait for four years to have the church building built, though he finally invested his own finances to finish it, it took a further five years until the promised £67 was reluctantly reimbursed to him. The first service in the church was held on the 25th of August, 1793. Though there is no record of what was preached, we know that on this date the Book of Common Prayer listed Jeremiah 38, 1-14 and 1 Corinthians 6. The church was designed in a T-shape and seated five to six hundred people, but within five years the church had burned down and sadly arson was a likely cause. While Governor Arthur Phillip had restricted Johnson's preaching to little more than moral subjects, which bothered Johnson's evangelistic convictions, it was a preceding governor, Francis Groves, who took office in November 1789 that gave Johnson the most troubles. Groves was not a sympathiser of the Protestant faith, and seemed to have done all that he could to limit Johnson's gospel message from impacting the colony. Groves had described Johnson as a very troublesome, discontented character, and his restrictions to the chaplaincy included. Only one service was to be held on Sunday, and this was to be at 6 a.m., and the church bell that Philip had brought over from England was never given to Johnson, but rather a small bell that could hardly be heard further than 100 metres away. Finally, when Samuel Marsden arrived as second chaplain in 1794, he found Johnson and Groves involved in serious quarrel. Johnson and Groves had different views on a chaplain's office, and in a letter to Wilberforce in 1794, Johnson wrote, No person dreads and hates disputes and differences more than I do. Yet few seem to have ever been involved and pestered with these more than I have of late. But this never held this first chaplain back from what he believed to be his God-given task. Johnson started a school in the church building and made sure that there was strong Bible nature throughout the teaching. Each morning would open with a hymn from the dissenter Reverend Dr. Isaac Watts and prayer. Each child was expected to learn Ten Commandments and Catechism. Later, under the supervision of his fourth governor, Philip Gidley King, an orphanage was organised, and Johnson was highly spoken of for his contributions there. Johnson's heart was for the souls of men to come to Christ. At one point, John Newton had warned Johnson about ministering to the passengers waiting in port on the Second Fleet, saying, it will be madness for you to risk your health by going down to the hold of the ship, where the air must be always putrid with the breath of a crowd of passengers in chains. But Johnson ignored this advice. He looked on all, convict and free, Church of England and other, settler or native, as equally entitled to his ministry, and stated that he would approach all men and women as intelligent creatures possessed with understanding and reason. 
In his affectionate address in 1794 called Address to the Inhabitants of the Colonies Established in the New South Wales and Norfolk Island, Johnson wrote, The Gospel proposes a free and glorious pardon to the guilty, cleansing to the polluted, healing to the sick, happiness to the miserable, light for those who sit in darkness, strength for the weak, food for the hungry, and even life for the dead. Johnson agreed with Philip to treat the native Aborigines well, and at one point Johnson and his wife took in a young Aboriginal girl to live with them as she suffered from smallpox. He was neither shy to visit the convicts in their huts, or travel distances to minister to others working further away. After almost 13 years of faithful ministry as Australia's first chaplain, Johnson and his family returned home to England in 1801 due to illness, leaving a task of chaplaincy to Samuel Marsden, whom later became known as a flogging parson of Parramatta and also the apostle to the Maoris. Upon arriving back in England, Johnson only received an extra year's wage for his long efforts in the colony, and later stated that he was wholly unprovided for. Johnson worked as a parish priest for Kent, Essex, and Norfolk, where he had previously been, and in 1810, Johnson was presented to St. Antheline's Church in London. In 1812, he made his last contribution to Australia by giving evidence before the Select Committee of the House of Commons on Transportation. Richard Johnson died 13th of March 1827 at 74 years of age and was buried at St. Antheline's Church. The Johnson had two surviving children, Milba Maria, who was born in 1790, and Henry Martin, born in 1792. Unfortunately, no descendants have been traced. Richard Johnson was a man of the people and was long remembered for his kindness, sincerity and loyalty to the gospel. Today a monument stands in Sydney, though often missed, of a man who will well be remembered as Australia's first chaplain. Johnson concluded his address to the inhabitants of the colonies established in New South Wales and Norfolk Island with these words. I'm longing, hoping and waiting for the dawn of that happy day when a heathen shall be given to the Lord Jesus for his inheritance and the utmost parts of the earth for his possession and when all the ends of the earth shall see, believe and rejoice in the salvation of God.